Whether it's a Lamborghini, a Rolls Royce, or even a Lego car, the simple six stage drawing method that I'm about to share with you can be used to create a mind blowing drawing of any car that you'd like. Now this is gonna be a bit of a longer video because I really want to go into depth on each of the stages. So buckle up and let's get straight to it. Now step number one isn't necessarily the most interesting step, but it is very, very, very important to get correct. And it's getting a good reference photo. Now there are many things that make up a good reference photo. I just wanna keep it simple with the top three things that I look out for in my references with the last one being the most important. So thing number one is making sure that the car is at an attractive angle. And I really like to go for the three quarter views as you get a bit of the front, you also get a bit of the side and you also get a bit of the top. Now front and also just plain side views are okay. They're just not quite as dynamic. And I think that the three quarter view really gives you the best drawing possible as I think it's the most attractive angle to look at cars. Now, the second thing is making sure there's not too many like reflections and shadows on the car metalwork because this can distract away from like the actual car itself. But having a few in there, it gives a bit more like detail and like interest and complexity and stuff. Just be aware that if you have loads in, it will make it harder to draw. So the third and most important thing when it comes to picking reference photos for your car drawings is making sure that they are very good quality. There is nothing worse than having to decipher a blurry mush and try and creating a good drawing from it. Just doesn't really happen. So now I've got that out of the way, let's move on to a more exciting step number two. So this is the sketching process. And in order to do this, I use the grid method. So I start by printing out the photo. Now, before you go and leave this video, because you do not have a printer and you're like, oh, I cannot do this anymore. There are apps that you can get even on like your phone. One, for example, is called Drawing Grid. And this is basically where you can upload your photo to the app and it'll put a grid onto the photo for you. And then it's the exact same process as I'm about to show you. So what I firstly need to do to this photograph is just cut out all the excess around it. And I do this using a cutting mat, a scalpel and a metal ruler. So now that I've done that, I'm just gonna move the chopping board out of the way, put the photo down here. And I'm just gonna bring in my ruler and uni pin fine liner here. So this is a 0.3 millimeter uni pin fine liner. And what I'm gonna be doing is I'm just gonna be splitting the length and width here into just equal sections. So I'm just gonna be measuring out the length which is 28.5 centimeters. So I'm just gonna get a calculator, do that divided by two, 28.5 divided by two, so 14.25, and then 14.25 just here, jot it in, and then do the exact same thing to the top, just like so. And then what I'm gonna do is just go 14.25 divided by two, which equals 15, what? 7.125 and then I'm just gonna mark a point there and I'm just gonna continue this process throughout the entire thing and I'm also gonna do it to the width and then this is basically gonna split it up into my nice grid. So now that we've gridded up this photo, let's head over to the drawing board. So here we are at the drawing board. Now I do have a drawing tilt, but it really doesn't matter if you're just working on a flat table. But what's really important is having some paper behind the piece of paper that you're going to be working on. Because my drawing tilt actually has like a fibrous wood grain to it. And I do not want these grains kind of blemishing themselves on the pencil work through the piece of paper I'm working on. So just having these, like a couple of pieces of paper behind the piece of paper that I'm working on, just provides some cushioning so that the pencil work on my drawing looks really nice and smooth. So I now need to put the exact same grid from my photograph onto my piece of paper and to do this I place the photo onto my piece of paper and then mark out where the grid lines are and then I go and connect them up using a Nick Pro mechanical pencil. I'm using a 0.5 millimeter here because it's really nice and sharp and stays sharp throughout the entire process and I'm also making sure to press really quite lightly here and I do this by holding it quite high up and also in an overhand grip. So just before we begin sketching I think it's really important that I show you my setup. So we've obviously got the gridded up piece of paper here. I've then got the gridded photo up here. This is just stuck on with some masking tape. And I've also got my photo on my computer screen there. And having this digital photo, it just means that it's easier to see the details that the photo being black and white has covered up because sometimes in like the shadows and things, it's hard to see details. And just having that digital photo just really helps to combat that. So starting off at the back here, we're now gonna use the reference points that we've got due to the grid to try and mark in all these contour lines and things. So these are the very obvious things that we can see. So we're not gonna jot in any of these shadows, just the very like obvious contour lines that make up the basic shape. So you can see here that this is just a little smidge out. So we're just gonna jot that in here and then it kind of comes up just like so and then starts to curl around and then it kind of comes all the way up and then cuts in this corner up here. So we're just gonna come all the way up like so and then just cut it in like that. So just at that very point there, just cuts across and then we can just build this over. And you can see here that it's got a bit fuzzy there. This is why I have the digital photo over there. So I can just look at it because it's a bit more clear 
and I could just get that clarity as well. So that is looking quite good going underneath. And the reason that we do have the grid is to provide all those reference points, because you can see here that it's just really easy to gauge where everything needs to go. And you might be thinking, well, the grid's kind of cheating. Why don't you do it freehand? But the thing is, I don't think you could ever get a sketch as accurate as you could doing it with the grid method than you could doing it freehand, if that makes sense. No, that really doesn't make sense. What I was trying to get at is the sketches that you get using the grid method are about 10 times more accurate than you could ever get doing it freehand. So I apologize for my English going to absolute pot there, but let's get straight back to the video. So now what we're gonna do is come down to the wheel here and you can see here that it's a really detailed section and something that can really help when it comes to detailed sections is actually splitting the grid up even further. So what I'm gonna do is just bring the ruler in and we're just gonna come up here to our reference photo and this is, I can't remember the exact measurements, but it's about 1.8. So we're just gonna split this, so 1.8 is gonna be 0 0.9. So we're just gonna do a little dot here, 0 0.9 and then 0 0.9 and we're just gonna put a line directly down here. And what you can see here is it's broken up into more boxes and given us more reference points in the more detailed areas. So it's gonna be really helpful in terms of gauging where everything needs to go. We can then come over and do the exact same thing to our piece of paper. So here, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, and then just joining them up like so. So now that we have more reference points, we can then go ahead and start doing this wheel. And I don't actually use any kind of French curves or like oval things lots of other people use. I just kind of eyeball it and just gently sketching it, keeping everything nice and light just in case we do make mistakes so that we don't end up having permanent like lines here because that's not cool. And just really constantly looking at the reference photo, basically every couple of strokes, just referring back to it. So I'm making sure that I'm staying on track. Very nice, so that's our nice oval shape. Just kind of looking at it as a whole oval now, just really smoothing out any places where I think I've gone a bit wonky. I think that's looking pretty nice. So now what we can do is start to add in a bit of the alloy details. So this is gonna be the gnarliest bit of this actually. So again, just kind of looking at that reference photo, bringing this down across. So there's like this little triangular shape here. So we're just gonna jot this in. So this comes down. Looking at the negative space instead of the space that's actually filled and doing it this way really helps to break it up and makes it a lot easier to tackle. And then we're just gonna come in and jot in this little spoke. I know it's not really called a spoke on cars, I don't really have another name for it at the moment. So this just comes up, back in, because you've got that little nook, and then coming forwards again, up like that. And then this comes down like so, because you can actually see this flat bit here. And then we can just come back and through. It comes back round, jots in, and then it just tucks underneath this little bit here, which is another spoke. So we're just gonna jot this in here. And you can see here that as we're just putting these lines in, the lines are actually providing reference points for other lines. And this is the thing with the grid method is like, yes, the grids are really great at providing more reference points, but the more you work on it, the more reference points it will make. And then the easier the sketching becomes, if that makes sense. This right here is actually the hardest part. So we just gotta get through this and it gradually becomes easier and easier. So again, staying quite nice and light, making sure to have quite a low angle here because we don't want to be having it really upright because that's when it gets quite dark. We get some quite dark lines if we don't want that. So just coming in, constantly look at that reference photo, bringing that through. And then we can just jot in the spoke here as well. So just coming across and moving my body position so I can actually get the right angle here. So this is gonna come there. So it just comes across like so. Bringing this up and over. And then this is gonna come all the way through and down just like so. And then again, looking at this negative space, we've got a trapezium shape here. So we're just gonna be jotting this in like so. Now we can just come over here, just like so, through, and then this cuts back up and you can see that on the line there. So it just comes back through. Very nice. So now what we can do is then come down again. Actually, we just need to beef this out a bit. Actually, no, I was a mistake. I made a mistake there, oh my goodness. So to correct mistakes in these smaller areas, I use a Touch Story rubber pencil, or you could use like a Tombow mono eraser, or even like a Derwent electric eraser, just so we can remove the um, mistake without removing the grid line. So just, as you can see there, nice and precise. So this is basically a pencil where instead of graphite as the lead, you've got a rubber. So anyway, let's continue. Now this is looking very weird at the moment. It's quite hard to tell what's going on, but trust me, when we start to color this in, a bit later, it will look a lot better. So make sure you stick around because I do appreciate this is a very long video, a lot of me talking, but I really want to be thorough with it so that you have all the tools that you need to create some really awesome car drawings. Just keep jotting in these little shapes that we can see. So just basically anything we see here, just jotting it in, not making anything up, just jotting in only the things that we can see. And if you can't see it, 
we obviously don't jot it in. I then just continue this entire method for the rest of the car and I hope that doing it in real time has proven that it is a very slow process. You do really have to take your time when doing this, but it is an insanely accurate method and I do believe that anyone can use it to create an extremely accurate car drawing because it breaks up that really complex subject of a car into just really nice digestible chunks. So there you go, that was my entire sketching process, but before we can move on to step number three, there is just two very important things that we need to do. So the first thing I need to do is just take a rubber and rub out the majority of the grid lines. And I actually leave the lines closest to the car so I can still use the grid during the colouring in process. I then go and hit the sketch with a kneadable eraser. So I go in with a dabbing motion over the entire sketch and what this does is it picks up any of the excess graphite that would otherwise smudge during the colouring in process. It also leaves us with a sketch that is easier to work on as it's removed all the messy sketchy lines and it also means that the lines are not dark enough to show through in the final result. But something that you need to be doing when using a kneadable eraser is kneading it occasionally and this will help to clean it so you're not just smearing graphite everywhere. So now that we've done that we can now move into phase three of my car drawing method using the alcohol markers. Now this part is particularly essential so stick around and I'll show you how I do it. So the first question when it comes to using alcohol markers is which alcohol markers should I actually buy? And the ones that I'm going to be using for this tutorial and the ones I'd recommend just in general are the Ahuhu Honolulu markers. Now if we open them up I'll show you exactly why. You can see here in just this set of 48 we have a really wide variety of colours and if I get this vermilion out so you just pull this over here you can see here that we have a brush tip. Now this is something that's only ever found on ridiculously expensive markers like Copic and like the Pro Marker brush but this allows you to get really really fine into those details because it's nice and sharp and it also has flexibility to it so you can also use it in those larger areas as well and the best part is is that these are very reasonably priced they're about a third of the price of any of those more expensive markers and they're the ones I'd recommend for complete beginners and even those who are like more advanced and for professional work as well so now we know what markers to use let's go on to actually picking the colors that we're going to be using for our drawing so I'm coming over to my reference photo and just picking out the basic color families that I can see so we have some greys we also have the red on the metalwork we've got some creamy yellows for the interior and some brighter yellows for the Ferrari logos we can then come over to our set of alcohol markers and pick out every single color in each of those color families and we can really utilize the lettering system on the top here to help us with that and we can then move the rest of these colors out of the way so now we can do one of two things. We could do a swatch test of every single one of these markers on this piece of paper and then compare what we have to what is on the reference photo. Or if you are working with the Ahuhu markers, the set actually comes with a color swatch sheet. So I can then directly compare the colors that we have to what is on the reference photo. So here we have the deep red. I can see this running through the shadows there as well as some of the cherry pink as well. We also have the vermilion over here. And I think this is the main color we're going to be using because it's quite a nice orangey red. We also have the coral pink, which I think I can use to blend between this vermilion and the highlights which I'm going to be using the pastel rose for and down here on the wheel and also a bit in the headlight we obviously have all our greys and I'm also going to be using a bit of blue in there as well to bring up the color saturation so it doesn't look dull in comparison to everything else so I hope I've proven that picking colors isn't actually that difficult however it does become easier the more you do it and one thing I'd recommend you doing is whenever you're like walking out and about and you're looking at cars and things it's just like observing like the little colors that make them up I mean yes it might be a red or a blue or a green car but what are the sub colors that actually make up that main color like are there like darker greens you got the intermediate greens the lighter greens and just constantly training your eye to see all these different colors will really help you when you come to pick colors for your realistic drawings so we now know the exact brand of markers that we need to use we now know the exact colors that we need to use so let's actually hit the sketch with some color and start bringing it to life so the first thing that i'm going to come and do is just grab the black marker here and just go on the inside of this wheel arch here and then one thing that I do want to point out is when you're using alcohol marks and you want a really, really thin line, if you use the, this little pointy bit of the chisel tip, this will give you a thinner line than what the bullet nib can give you. So you can see that that's just even thinner than that um, brush tip. I keep saying bullet nib. What a pleb. Right, so now we're gonna go and hit it with the red. So the first red that I'm gonna be using, so I'm gonna be using our coral pink. I think this is the right one. I'll just do a little swatch. And doing little swatches here and there is always a good um, thing to do so you know exactly what color you've got in your hand before you go onto the piece of paper. So I think that's a good color to use. So we're just gonna go over the wheel arch here. So now at the back here, we have a much lighter highlight. So I'm actually gonna come in and grab the pastel rose. So this is our highlight color that we're going to be using. So as you can see there, nice and bright. And we're just gonna stick this in, just like so. Just kind of jotting it in, because there's lots of like weird reflections in the back here. So just kind of not making it too crisp, just indicating that there is some like reflections and stuff in here. 
just like so. And all we're gonna do is just come in and start using this vermilion. So this is basically gonna be our base color. So this is really the proper color of the car. So here, just jotting this in, because we've got that nice orangey kind of hint to it. And then we've got this highlight on the top, so we're not gonna put the marker into that, because one thing you need to know about alcohol markers is it's always better to go lighter than what you think, because it's always easier to darken a lighter area than it is to lighten a darker one. So now we're just gonna come back in with the pastel rose. This is definitely our lightest one, yep. So then we're just gonna come up here and we're just gonna blend this. And to blend, you get the lighter color and you just put it over the intersection between the, um, the lighter area and the dark area and you just kind of layer it a bit. So you just kind of do this and you can see there that that's kind of creating a bit more of a seamless transition between this vermilion and this pastel rose on the top here. All right, and I reckon this pastel rose can be used all the way down here. So now what we can do is just come in with our coral pink again, and we're just going to here, and just jot in here. Actually, coral pink probably wasn't the best one. We're gonna come back in with a vermilion. Coming around, and I know a lot of people are probably shouting at the screen like, why didn't you use like fine liners and stuff to go around it? And the thing is, is like, I used to, but then it just felt a bit unnecessary um, because I could just go in a bit later with the black colored pencil and do all the outlines and stuff. And I've just found that it's a bit more efficient doing it that way, opposed to having a specific step designated to um, doing the fine liners. You can see here that this really isn't that neat because the whole purpose of this is just to provide a foundation for the colored pencils to go on top of a bit later, because what can happen is when you put colored pencils on top of white paper, the white paper grains can still show through, but having like this marker base down, it means that there's no whites to show through. The only thing that shows through is the red and the red is the thing that we want. So the colors look extra vibrant, like actual real cars. So this is definitely an essential part and this is basically the whole reason that I'm doing this. Not being too particular here, just jotting everything in so it's all red. Just having it a bit more detailed because I know a lot of people will just um, come in with like one really light color and then just go over the entire thing and then that will be their marker base. But I do like to kind of establish all the like details and things because I find it just makes the colored pencil work a bit later a lot easier as I have a blueprint for where everything needs to go. And at the end of the day, markers do cover the page a lot quicker than what pencils do as well. So again, just really makes the workflow more efficient. And then here we do have like some, like a mesh, but we're just gonna go over this, the entire thing with a black and then we can, um, Coming a bit later with the colored pencils and then jot it in with the colored pencils. Just finishing this bit off here. And now what we can do is just go over this all with the pastel rose, this lighter color, just blend it in a bit more. So just going over the intersection between the dark and the lighter colors with this pastel rose and just blending it a bit more. And it's just making it a bit smoother because obviously with cars, they are very smooth and all the transitions between the colors are relatively smooth, except in like all the highlights and stuff. Just really constantly looking at that reference photo picking up on anything we can see and not making it up because when we make stuff up that's when it starts to get a bit weird. Now one of the most important things to remember when doing base layers is that it is just a base layer. It does not need to be perfect. We do not need to pick up on every single detail here because we can do that a lot better with the colored pencils a bit later. You can also see that I'm not really doing a lot of blending. I'm just making sure to stay within the lines and so that I can also see all, like, all the individual panels and things. So I'm not going too crazy but at the same time I'm not being too particular. So just getting some colors down so that the colored pencils a bit later will look extra vibrant. So this larger area here is actually a place where it's all kind of the same color. And for this, we're actually gonna utilize the chisel tip of our marker. So we're just gonna come in here and then just come like this. And then you can see here, because it covers so much more area than what the brush tip could in like just about four strokes, that it's a lot less streaky than it would be if I did use the brush tip. So that's really where you use the chisel tip. So like in the larger areas where you don't want it to be as streaky. So something cool that I want to point out when I did the seat and the backrest here is that I didn't necessarily have the exact color that I wanted to do like all of this stuff. So I actually just used the warm gray one here. And what I did is in the lighter areas, I just used one layer. However, in the darker areas, I just layered the marker on top of itself. And you can see here that just having multiple layers makes a darker color. So basically with just one marker, you can create tonal variation in an area where you don't necessarily have a load of like different markers to create all the different colors. So I think I've just covered most of the key tips when it comes to doing markers, but one of the most important things you need to remember is that the more you do marker works, the easier it will become. For instance, when I first started, my first ever like car marker base was very basic. It was literally just like three colors, just like main basic shapes. But as I've done more and more, they've gradually become more complex. I've become more confident in like where I'm gonna put the colors because something else that can happen is you've just spent a lot of time doing a skill 
sketch and you're like, oh, this will create permanent marks. If I go wrong, then it'll really mess up and have to start again. But really, I wouldn't worry about that because you can always cover up any mistakes you do using the colored pencils a bit later. But if there is just one thing that I want you to take away from this entire marker section, it's to always go lighter than what you think. This is because it's always easier to darken a lighter area than it is to lighten a darker one. So there you go, that was exactly how I use alcohol markers to do my base layers for my car drawings. So now we can move on to phase number four, the most time consuming part, using the colored pencils. Now, just like with the markers, the first question that we need to ask is which pencils do we actually use? And the ones that I use on every single one of my drawings and I'd recommend to anyone are the Faber-Castell polychromos. And there are three reasons with the third one being the most important. Now, before I go into that, I just want to point out that you do not need a full pack of 120 colors. A pack of 36 is more than enough. You'll be able to create really awesome drawings with just these 36 colors. And I do also appreciate that they are very expensive, but you need to remember that the more expensive pencils, they're just higher quality and they're more capable of creating really awesome artworks. So with that said, let's move into the three main reasons that I use these Faber-Castell polychromos. So number one is that the colors are very vibrant and saturated, so the drawings you create with them will really pop. Number two is that the leads are oil-based opposed to traditional wax-based pencils, so they maintain their point for a lot longer, so you're able to go into those details and also keep everything really nice and crisp. And finally, and most importantly, number three is that they blend together insanely well. And this is really, really important when creating car drawings as you want all the transitions between all the different colors to be as seamless as possible. So let's now have a look at how to actually pick the correct colors for our drawings. Now I pick my colored pencils in a similar way to that of my alcohol markers by looking at the reference photo and going, okay, so I've got reds, yellows, beiges, grays, and I'm also gonna be using some lighter and darker blues in the gray areas to keep the color saturation up so they don't look dull in comparison to the rest of the piece. We can then split these color families into subcategories of the darkest colors, the lightest colors, and the intermediary colors. Now the intermediaries aren't quite as dark as the darkest colors, but aren't quite as light as the lightest colors and really make up the majority of the subject. Now when it comes to actually picking the correct colors to use, it really is just a case of trying them on your drawing and seeing if they do match the colors that are on your reference photo. And if not, we just stick them back in the case. But if they do, hallelujah, we keep them out and we keep using them. So now we are finally set to actually start using the colored pencils. And I'm gonna walk you through how to do the metal work, how I'm going to be doing the more detailed alloy down here, the headlights, the windshield, and also the mesh at the front of the car. So starting off with the panels here, I'm gonna share with you how I'm gonna turn this panel here into something a bit more like this. So the first thing that we need to do is come in with a dark pencil. I'm using a dark middle cadmium red here and what we're going to do is just go in and establish where all the reflections, details and any of the kind of shadows that we missed out in the marker base need to go. Now I'm not pressing very hard here, I'm just getting a good idea of where everything needs to go. So this has made up our first layer and what I want to do now is come in with a lighter colour. So in this case I'm using the Pale Geranium Lake, that is a funky name. And I'm just going to kind of go over that darker colour that I just used and just kind of blend it a bit. So here I'm just not really looking at the reference hit photo here, I'm just kind of just going over the entire thing with this lighter colour and just putting some pigment down because what this will do is when we put more pigment on it in some future layers is it will go down a lot smoother because it will blend with this pale geranium lake. Just create a much smoother surface and the blending will be a lot better as well. So I'm actually going to come in with a white where I just pick up on all the, um, the highlights here. And I'm actually pressing fairly hard with this because I want these highlights to be quite prominent. So now that's around two layers done. And what I want to do now is come back in with that original dark color. So our middle cadmium red and just start to darken up some of those shadows again, because what's happened as we've gone over those dark areas with a lighter color, it's reduced the contrast and everything's gone a bit flat. But now when we come back in with this middle cadmium red, it should bring that contrast back up and then also be a lot smoother initially because you've got so much pigment down. And I'm really starting to press quite hard here as I'm being quite definite with the lines and marks that I'm making now because it's these are the finishing layers, really blemishing the paper. It's now coming in with a deep scarlet red. So this is basically one of those orangey reds anyway. So just coming through here and just pushing this white line back into the page, just like so. You can see there, that's looking a bit more realistic now. So it doesn't have just like this white line going all the way through. Now I'm coming in with a scarlet red. So this is a very orange red. And then just again, going over these darker areas and really blending it. And you can see here, 
that it really is just a process of using lots and lots of layers. And then with each layer, you can add another level of complexity to it because you can pick up on more details. And yeah, it gets smoother and more like the actual car in the reference photo. So again, I think everything's become quite flat there. So I'm just gonna outline the bottom of this with a black pencil actually. I then keep adding in layers and details with the pencils that I've just shown you. And something that I'm doing is pressing gradually harder and harder and really blemishing the page. Now blemishing is where you break down the tooth of the paper and this will give you a really nice smooth result. But something that you need to bear in mind is that once you've blemished the paper, you can't put any more pigment on top because obviously that pigment doesn't have anything to grip onto. So there you go. That was how I do the panels and this applies to like any color panel that you're doing. So like any color car or just any panel really. So yeah, let's move on to doing the wheel. So what I'm going to do here is very similar to what I did with the panel where I'm going to come in with a really dark pencil, in this case the black, and just really like clean up the marker base because you can see here it's quite messy and hard to look at and this will help really give us clarity when it comes to shading it. So just like that I now have something that is much more approachable and doesn't just look like a mush of colour. So my next step is to go in with a white pencil and just jot in all the highlights and it's really important that you do this before you go in with other colours because the white pencil in the polychromo set is actually very translucent and is very poor at going over the top of coloured pencils so it's always better to put the white in first and then work around it with the colours. So now that I've done that I'm going to come in with a cold grey 5 pencil and just jot in the shadows on the alloys here. I'm now going to use the cold grey 2 to blend between the cold grey 5 that we just used and also the white. So now you're probably noticing that this grey is looking very dull in comparison to the really bright red car. So what I'm going to do now is use a dark indigo in the shadows and also some light turquoise in the highlights and this will really help bring the colour saturation of the wheel alloy up so it looks really nice and vibrant. So I now just want to sort out all the details behind the alloy itself like the brake caliper and the brake disc and I'm doing this in the exact same way as we did earlier by using lots and lots of layers to create a really smooth look. So this is now looking pretty cool and I want to shift my focus to doing the tyre itself. So in doing the tyre we're going to be using pencil strokes to follow the curvature of the wheel. We're also going to be using lots of layers again and also incorporating some of that dark indigo in the shadows, some light turquoise in the highlights to bring up that colour saturation and when you're doing the treads of the wheels as well you need to know that the treads are closer together at the top and the bottom of the wheel and then they get further apart towards the middle. So I've now spent over an hour working on this wheel and all that's left to do is to add some more details to this alloy here. So I'm going to call this finished, however I'll probably come back to it a bit later, but yeah. Let's just move on. So coming up here to the windshield, I want to show you how to create the illusion that there is actually glass here. So you can see here that I've actually jotted in the things behind the windshield. So we've got the dashboard, the steering wheel, the seat, and this backrest bit. And I did these in the exact same way as everything else by using lots and lots of layers. So what we need to do is we need to come in with some grays and we're gonna start over here and just jot in some reflections. Also using some blues for this as well, because obviously we've got the reflection from the sky. And you can see here that it's more blurry to the right here than it is to the left. So you can actually see more of the detail here than you can at the back here. So we're just going to really try to layer up these greys at the back here. And again, really looking at that reference photo so we're getting all the shapes in the right place. Because we can just see a bit of indication of the left hand column here on the car. Or the right if we're looking at it this way. Now what I can do is I can use this dark indigo just to jot in some reflections on the windshield itself. So we've got here... We're just jotting these things, looking at the reference photos to make sure they're generally in the right place. This is like some trees and things that are just reflecting in there. So again, it really is just a case of building up these layers because as we've already seen, the more layers you do, the smoother the pencil work starts to look. And I'm really focusing on using strokes that follow the curvature of the windshield. So at the back here, they follow this angle and at the front, they follow here. And then we can go over those objects that we um, established behind the windshield with the gray pencil and almost like blend them into the windshield, if that makes sense. So just just almost make them look a lot softer and less detailed and then this will really help convey that they are behind the glass. And using the white pencil for this is really helpful. And now using these side to side strokes as well to really try and blend everything together a bit more. But we can actually blend this further using the next stage in my car drawing method which I shall keep as a surprise. So stay tuned. And really to finish this off I'm just going to go over the entire thing pressing really quite firmly with this white pencil just to really smooth everything out and smush it all together. And although it is a bit late to say, but it's really important that you do establish all these bits behind the glass before you go and actually do the glass, because I can't actually do anything about any of these shapes now, so how this is now is how it's going to permanently be. So there you go, that was exactly how I did the windshield. And if I'm being honest, I don't think I actually need to go through the headlight on its own, because the method is very similar. It's just a case of establishing all the bulbs and things, and then going over the top with a white pencil just to really blend it all together and make it look like there is a glass film on top of everything. So in order to do the mesh at the front here, 
I'm just going to take a very sharp white pencil and draw a bunch of parallel angled lines, all at equal distances from one another. And I'm also not really counting how many there are on the reference photo because I'd go a bit mad. I'm just really gauging a rough number with my eye. We can then go and draw another set of lines that are perpendicular to the lines that we have just drawn. So now we can go in and add some shading and we need to remember that it's going to be darker all the way around the outside where the metal work is casting a shadow onto it and then the middle bit's going to be a lot lighter where the light can actually get to it. Now all that's left to do is just add some more shades in using a variety of greys, even some of that dark indigo again and yeah that's pretty much it. That white pencil is super effective at creating the illusion of a mesh. So we've now covered how to use coloured pencils on all the fundamental car parts of the panels, the wheels, the glass, the meshes. But if there's just one thing that I'd like you to take away from this entire coloured pencil section it's to really focus on using layers as using lots of layers will really help to smooth out your pencil work and really bring your car drawings to life. So with that said let's move on to step number five. But just before we do move on to that stage, I just want to erase all the remaining grid lines and also add a shadow to the underside of the car. Now, in order to do this, I use an electric eraser because it's nice and precise, but a normal eraser will work perfectly fine. So in order to jot in the shadow, I'm going to be using a black marker and also a cool gray seven. So coming in first with the black marker, we're just going to go really, really dark on the underside here. And you can also see a very light patch just here. So we're going to leave that and do that with a cool gray seven instead. Just constantly looking at that reference photo, making sure we get it in the right place. And at the front here, we can actually see the gray so there isn't a shadow on this area here and this is just proving that it's like lifted off the floor and not just like sat on it. So I'm now going to come in with the cool grey 7 and start diffusing it to the colour of the paper. So I'm actually going to come in with a cool grey 4 and just diffuse it into the paper even more. So what we can do now is just come in with a variety of grey pencils and also a black pencil and just really smooth out this shadow. Now when we're doing pencil work on the shadow, we want to be using pencil strokes that go in the direction parallel to that of the wheel, if that makes sense. And this way you'll help really convey that there is actually like a ground there and it's not just sitting on some sort of like blurry mush that you've just roughly jotted in. And obviously the closer the shadow is to the car, the darker it will be. So we're gonna make sure to press a lot harder with the black pencil closer to the car. So I'm not gonna shift over to the cool gray five. And again, we're pressing really quite hard here because obviously we don't want it to look grainy and we want it to be nice and smooth. So at the front here, it gets a lot lighter. So I'm just gonna use a cool gray three to soften out that cool gray five. And just to finish it off, I'm gonna use a cool gray two on all the edges just to really soften it up. Now you can really see here that that shadow is really grounded it on the page and I'd recommend that you add a shadow to every single one of your car drawings and now that we've done that we can now move on to stage number five of my drawing process which is also my favorite stage and it's really important that before moving on to stage number five that you're really happy with your pencil work because once we do stage number five you will not be able to alter it. So now you may be thinking what is this weird and wonderful step number five? Now you may notice in your alcohol marker set there is something called a colorless blender. Now you can use this with other alcohol markers to smooth out the blends between different colors however what I like to use it for is to dissolve the colored pencil pigment, pushing it further into the tooth of the paper and making the pencil work look even smoother. So let me show you exactly how I do that. So what we're gonna do is we're literally just gonna go over the top of the pencil work with this marker. So just like so, just following the direction that we've already been in with the colored pencils. And you can see here how it's very subtle, but it is dissolving that pigment and really making it even smoother. But something that's really important to note is that whenever you're going from a dark area to a lighter area, you firstly want to come to the side here on a scrap piece of paper and just kind of like do a little swatch and get rid of any of the pigment that's still on the marker. And this way you won't end up contaminating those highlights with the pigment from the darker areas. And if I'm being honest, that is pretty much it. It's not a very long stage, but it is very, very cool to do because you can just really appreciate that all your work starts to come together and everything becomes really smooth. And this is a pretty essential stage if you want your car drawings to look like photographs, as this will obviously give it an ink like finish so it looks like it's actually been printed when in reality you've actually drawn it which is pretty cool so now that we have done that it's now time to move into the final stage number six adding in the highlights. So in order to do this, I'm using a 0.7 millimeter white Posca marker and I'm basically going over the entire car, just picking out any areas where I think I've gone a bit too dark and just brightening them up with some white paint. And then what I do is I come in with some colored pencils and I just blend the highlights in a bit so they look like they're actually part of the piece. So there you go, in just over half an hour, we have covered all six stages of my realistic car drawing method. I hope you found this video helpful and if you'd like to learn more about any of these stages that I've covered today, I do have a free course linked in the comment section down below. And if you'd like to see more videos just like this one, be sure to hit that subscribe button and I shall see you in the next video, which should appear somewhere on screen right about now. I'm just gonna awkwardly stare here for the five seconds that I need in order to put this um, video 